that Paul said to make these assumptions and accusations against our community, we think is, is very, very offensive. Um, to rescind this statement, or to sort of back away from this statement, Lieutenant Paul Henderson said that this quote was taken out of context, and that all said statements didn't refer to Gibson, but to a reporter's question about how the other bar patrons reacted to the officer that night. Um, so he's trying to flip the argument, argument a bit and trying to distance himself from it. So I'm going to pass it off to uh, Rich, right? Um, and he's going to talk about a few other quotes before we get into some other issues.
surprise with our place of society. We will stand up uh, proudly in our sight and speak out for a large man for men. Lastly, I'd like to spend a quote from philosopher uh, Mike Michael Foucault regarding the struggles of culture and culture. If repression has indeed been a fundamental link between power, knowledge, and sexuality since the classical age, Not be able to be, not be able to clear uh, the uh, I mean acceptance of a by a couple of considerable talk. to do then is to take these texts 
and turn the logic around. Or another way that I want to put it is we have to detoxify these texts. First of all, let me suggest to you that we have a series of texts that have generally been used uh, to bash homosexual people. In the LGBT community, they're called for short clobber texts. And you may have a different list than I do, but looking at the canon or the list of books in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the very best, I think, that even ardent opponents of homosexuality can come up with are five texts. Out of 66 books in the Protestant edition of Scripture, and even more than that in Roman Catholic and Orthodox texts of Scripture, a very small number indeed. One of those that is not particularly on this list is one I'd like to start with right now, and that has to do with the story in the book of Genesis recorded in the 19th chapter, which has to do with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which has been used almost universally to suggest that homosexuals and anyone who participates in homosexual behavior is deserving of death. Now, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah has been used only in about the last 100 years in that fashion. If you take a look at the testimony of other voices from the Hebrew Bible, say the major prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel has no problem telling you what that story is about, and it's not about a condemnation of homosexuals or homosexual activity. Instead, it is a lack of hospitality. The citizens of the city are seen as being guilty of being inhospitable to strangers. In the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke, when Jesus speaks about this text, he makes the very same point. So, first and foremost, we have to remove any of the onus from the Sodom and Gomorrah story. It is, first of all, not about homosexuality, and secondly, not a condemnation of any homosexual or any homosexual behavior. There are two texts that are included in this book that are particularly toxic and have been used in toxic ways. Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, the famous abomination passages that have been used as justification for exterminating homosexual men. But as a matter of fact, if you take a look at the catalog of clean and unclean categories that are mentioned in the book of Leviticus, you wind up understanding that there are a whole variety of other things that are considered, quote, abomination, unquote, almost in the same way. For example, going out and eating barbecue at one of our local barbecue joints here in Fort Worth would be an abomination. Or having a nice family dinner at Red Lobster because in the interpretation of the writer of the book of Leviticus, anyone who eats shellfish is a person who is condemned. A person who wears clothing with mixed fibers, which has part wool or polyester or cotton, that kind of person is also an abomination. The point that I'm trying to make here is that we have selectively use these texts in order to establish preconceived notions that we have had about what is clean and unclean, what is acceptable and unacceptable, what is true and what is false. Neither of these passages in Leviticus anticipated committed same-sex relationships between lesbians or gay men. Neither of these is an appropriate passage with which to condemn homosexuals or homosexual behavior. Now, in the New Testament, there are two particular texts that are listed here worthy of our consideration. First one, from the letter of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, which is in the 6th chapter, the 9th through the 10th verse, uses two particularly slick words. In Greek, one of these words used to re refer to homosexual persons is malakoi which means something like soft or passive. And the other one is arsenkoetai, which is virtually untranslatable into English, actually. And so we have no real idea, deep down, what arsenkoetai means. 
And yet, the system of belief is so powerful, the preconceived understanding that LGBT people are condemned, that these texts and these terms are employed to bolster the justification of attacks upon lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and transgender persons. There was no anticipation in the first century of anything like what we understand as homosexual or homosexuality. Neither one of them were conceived of. But what is conceived of in 1 Corinthians 6 is a condemnation of abusive behavior. So what is being talked about here are abuses of power, not about homosexuality as a moral category or homosexual persons as condemned people. Neither one. Probably the most useful passage for the enemies of LGBT folks has been Romans 1, 26 through 27. And that particular text seems to suggest to the belief system that condemns gay people that there is something deeply unnatural about LGBT people and their behavior. But that is not what this text is addressing either. What I'd like to do is invite people who think otherwise to read this text along with us. Because the ancient logic from the first century that the Apostle Paul was talking about was a wholesale condemnation of the worship of false gods. And this text, as a part of a catalog of different sins that the Apostle Paul wants to put forward, including pride and greed and adultery, which it seems that our opponents do not get too exercised about because we've not seen very many of them that have been turned away from church lately. Those particular sins are included in order to make the case that there is no one in Israel who is sinless before God. Everyone comes under God's judgment. Once again, the emphasis in Romans 1 is the same as it is in 1 Corinthians 6. The Apostle Paul is speaking out against abuses, abuses of power, not against gay men for their practices, not against lesbians for their practices either. So what is it that we're actually dealing with when we're dealing with biblical uses that wind up being weapons against LGBT people? What we're dealing with is a belief system that is out of step, outmoded, and doesn't work anymore. I think that as a rule of interpretation, there are probably two rules that we need to use. The first is from St. Augustine, the great North African Orthodox bishop, who said that any interpretation from the Bible needs to increase the love of God in neighbor. So I would put that question to persons who would use texts to exclude and condemn a part of the human family. Is the use of these texts in harmony with St. Augustine's interpretive rule? I don't think so, because it certainly does not increase the love of God in neighbor. And secondly, the interpretive rule that I use most prominently in my reading of Scripture is the life and the holy bent of Jesus Christ himself. Are these texts being used in a fashion that we believe is in harmony with who Jesus was as the incarnate love of God, the expression of grace and welcome to all of God's people? When you ask in the New Testament, what did Jesus have to say about homosexuality, I can sum it up pretty quickly. Jesus had nothing to say. If you ask me what Moses had to say about homosexuality, say in the Ten Commandments, it's the very same thing. Nothing. The opponents of homosexuality, people who seek to exclude folks who are different, are simply employing texts according to a deep-seated homophobia and heterosexism that reads that prejudice back into the text themselves. What I'd like to conclude with is an illustration that uh, Stephen Shoemaker, who was pastor of Broadway Baptist Church here in Fort Worth, Texas, made. He preached a sermon in Charlotte, North Carolina at Myers Park Baptist Church in which he used an illustration from Mark Twain's Huck Finn. 
You remember the story? Huck Finn is going down the Mississippi River with the slave Jim, who was owned by a slave owner named Miss Watson. Everything in Huck Finn's training had been that he should report that Jim was a runaway slave. Everything he had been taught in church, every scripture verse that had been used to bolster slavery convinced him that that was so. And so Mark Twain tells us that Huck Finn actually wrote a little note that he was going to send to Miss Watson telling her where Jim the slave actually was so he could be apprehended and taken back into slavery. But at that moment, this is the way that Mark Twain tells the story. He says, in Huck's words, I took up that letter and I held it in my hand. I was trembling because I've got to decide forever between two things. And I noted. I studied it a minute, sort of holding my breath, then says to myself, all right then, I'll go to hell. And he tore up the letter. Because he preferred his friend to anything that had been imposed on him that condemned his friend. In the end, the LGBT people are our neighbors. And they are as deserving of the embrace of scripture and Christian tradition as anyone else in the family of God. I sure appreciate the time to make the point. My name is Bill Hine, and I am the chair of the local chapter of Glissant, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. Uh, we serve a six-state area, ensuring that schools are safe for all youth and children and uh, people, regardless of sexual orientation and/or gender, gender identity expression. I think these two words that we have up here are powerful words that we feel in our schools each and every day. And the quotes that are used help to influence teachers, administrators, parents. But when they read these statements, they make an other. The word homophobia and heterosexism are ever present from the time that children have reached kindergarten. The little boy who plays with dolls over playing with a truck. The little girl who would rather wear jeans than a little dress on a Sunday morning. And what we look at when we look at these quotes is we look at the other. We're constantly putting people into categories and making them feel less. For example, the mayor's quote, it might have been helpful if the owner of the lounge had informed officers this day was more than just another day of the week. And I think that's where we as educators and we as a community don't do our job in educating our young people of the history of this great nation of equality and hope. I think it's our job as educators and what Felicity believes is educating our youth and young adults and children and teachers and administrators and parents and community members to know that all people are created equal, that we all have rights, and that we all deserve the same thing, education, hope, family, acceptance. When I look at these two words, it's sad to see how true they really are in our school systems these days. A year and a half ago, Lawrence King was shot and killed in his science classroom for simply bringing a Valentine's Day card to another male student. This year, the death and suicides of two young, not even teenagers, due to their perceived sexual orientation. Perceived. Not even if they were gay or straight. But because in our heterosexist world we fit into a box of this is what it means to be a straight man, this is what it means to be a straight woman, they didn't fit that. And in all the despair they had, they had one option that they felt they could go to. Echoing the words of Steve, Blake, Rich, desperate times when we see young people 
feeling that they have no option, nowhere to turn. And yet, in our media, we see this other group that's despisable. We see it in scripture. We see it all around. What I ask is that we look at what we can do for youth and young adults and children as they are growing up, as they become a part of our future. We see that 40% of youth that are homeless are GLBT. We see that 25% of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth don't go on to college, don't graduate. What kind of future are we creating for our world when people that are different can't learn? When they're not able to share who they really are? So I ask our city officials here in Fort Worth to think about the message they're sending to the kids in their lives. The kid that really wants to play with that doll, the girl who has the toy truck, and to see what we need to do to change the message of hate, to change the message of fear into a message of hope for you. Listen, one of our goals is to provide that education to administrators in schools, to teachers, to community members. The information is out there if you're willing to look at it. There's action days out there for many organizations, including Gay of Silence and No Name Calling Week, that help to educate, but yet we don't acknowledge them. However, just on the other side of this metroplex, a year ago, the mayor of Dallas proclaimed Day of Silence for the entire city of Dallas. And in Fort Worth, we got an article bashing what it meant to be promoting homosexuality in school. It's sad to be a part of this big community that shares so many wonderful things, but can't seem to communicate the message of equality for everyone. Thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening and to be a resource to this community. <laughs> My name is Joe Remzik and I am the Fort Worth Community Organizer for Queer Liver Action, and I'm going to end our event with a couple of quotes uh, regarding apology, if you can call them that. Um, the first one is a quote during the city council meeting uh, where some people uh, displayed their anger and frustration at the mayor's intolerance of hearing GLBT concerns. And his response was, if you want an apology from the mayor of Fort Worth, I am sorry about what happened in Fort Worth. Period. That's by my mayor, Mike Moncrief. That is equivalent to a mother telling her child to apologize to the other child for pinching them. This is not an apology. This is something forced, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many uh, people in my community. Forced this is obviously not well intended and was not well received. Later in the week, a member of his office um, to address his apology. The mayor and council are always sorry if anyone is ever hurt in our city, Begley said Wednesday. The mayor has asked for a thorough investigation of what happened in the Rainbow Lounge to the point that he's asked for a U.S. Attorney General to get involved. They want to make sure that all voices are heard, but the apology to everyone, the apology is geared toward anyone that is ever hurt in the city of Fort Worth. To say that I'm insulted by this is, is an understatement. I am completely outraged by this comment. This not only undermines, it really just minimizes what Chad Gibson has been through. It sets the city of Fort Worth back by decades, as far as I'm concerned. This is insulting to retract his meager apology to a few words that anybody can get hurt. He's just as sorry for me getting hurt tripping on a leaf on one of his streets and getting really killed by uh, the city of Fort Worth Police Department. Um, this is one of the saddest days as a Fort Worth resident that I've ever experienced. Uh, my hope is that together, all of us through Liberation, Action, all of the other fine organizations get together and really end this.
you want a closing statement? Um, no, I would no, I'd like to thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>